What is good urban design? I want to introduce you to Design Revue. It's a method that's based on 100 years of theory and practice adapted to a world of pandemic, climate change and uncertainty. Design Review uses eight criteria of successful urban design. You can use Design Review to write the brief for a building, to write planning policy, to create a design code, or to carry out a design review of a development proposal. You can also use it to assess the urban design qualities of a development, a commercial building, a public space, a housing scheme, or anything else. In this video, I want to show an example of how the method can be used to assess a single building. It's the headquarters of Bloomberg in the City of London. The Bloomberg building won the RIBA Sterling Prize as Britain's best new building in 2018. Is it good urban design? Let's use Design Reviewer's eight criteria to find out. First, does the Bloomberg building have a mix of activities and uses appropriate to the place and people? This is a financial operation in the City of London. So the principal use is certainly appropriate. The building also contains the Bloomberg space, which displays artworks. The development has gone out of its way to celebrate the history of the site. The ruins of the Mithraeum, a Roman shrine, have been relocated to the site and made public. A route has been cut through the development on the line of the medieval Budge Row, which may follow the line of the Roman Watling Street. A three-part sculpture and water feature evokes the long-buried Walbrook River, but apart from the eateries in the arcade, nearly all the rest is offices. The frontage along Cannon Street comprises glass windows and a large delivery bay. Apart from this, there's no activity on the frontage. The same applies to the other streets. The ground floor windows are of smoke glass, so it's difficult to see activity inside the building. The same smoke glass is found in the Bloomberg Arcade, where it's difficult to see inside the restaurants and bars. Second, is the Bloomberg building fit for its specific purpose? The specific purpose of the Bloomberg building is to accommodate a business that communicates financial information. As the building has been tailor-made for its users at enormous expense, it is no doubt fit for that purpose. The building contains a wellness centre and spaces for reflection. Each worker has an electrically operated desk that allows them to work standing up, so that should reduce the instance of backache. But if you're one of the staff sitting at your desk hoping for some daylight or a view of the sky, you're likely to be disappointed. Third, is the Bloomberg building adaptable to other uses and resilient to change? The building would be adaptable to some extent, especially as the interior has large, column-free spaces, but new uses would be a waste of the vast sum spent on making everything bespoke to Bloomberg. The fourth design reviewer question, are the spaces widely used and enjoyed? The new pedestrianised arcade has been cut diagonally through the building, but it's rather gloomy and the opportunity has been missed to create a real street with a mix of uses. There are three small plazas at the corners of the site but the security guards make one feel unwelcome. Most of the wall area at ground level is blank, making the surrounding area seem rather forbidding. Fifth, is the Bloomberg building accessible and navigable? With a main line railway station 50 metres away, two different underground stations and numerous bus services, the Bloomberg headquarters couldn't be better connected by public transport, and the building has no employees parking, so there's no encouragement to drive. The arcade is a welcome new public footway, providing a direct route to Cannon Street Station. Apparently, great efforts have been made to provide clear signage within the building. Outside, it isn't clear where the entrance is. Sixth, is the Bloomberg building biodiverse? There's a handful of small trees in the plaza, some beehives on the roof and apparently a small area of green roof. That's very little for such a large development. Seventh, is the Bloomberg building efficient in its use of resources and does it have a minimal impact on other resources, natural and man-made? The Bloomberg building has been hailed as the world's most sustainable office building on the basis of its BRIAM rating. Its innovative power, lighting, water and ventilation systems 
make it highly efficient in operation, but an assessment of its carbon footprint would need to calculate the energy embodied in its concrete, the 600 tonnes of bronze imported from Japan, the 9,600 tonnes of Derbyshire sandstone, the shiploads of granite from India, and according to its fabricator, 15,500 tonnes of steel, more than double the weight of the Eiffel Tower, they say. In terms of energy and use, the lighting is highly efficient. There are a total of 500,000 LEDs, which, with 4,000 employees, works out at a dazzling 125 LEDs per person. All in all, the building's carbon footprint must be immense. The location means that staff can travel to the building using a well-developed public transport system, and there's no need to travel by private car. However, few of them will live within walking distance, as there's very little residential development nearby. The overall use of resources will depend on how long the building lasts. Many office buildings are demolished and rebuilt after as little as 60 years, as was the office block that the Bloomberg building replaced. In these circumstances, the energy used in construction will be greater than the energy consumed through the use of the building. And the final design reviewer question. Is the Bloomberg building beautiful and interesting? The building replaces a 1950s office block that the writer and broadcaster Ian Nairn described as having no virtues and no vices. It is the null point of architecture. So that was no great loss. There was a previous planning permission for a 22-storey building, but Bloomberg has limited its headquarters to 10, which is respectful. The building is beautifully made inside and out. In terms of the amount of thought that has gone into the design, this is a highly impressive piece of architecture. But why is the building so anonymous? It's not clear what it is, where the entrance is, or what happens inside it. Does the Bloomberg building fit in? Most of the buildings in Cannon Street still have narrow frontages, which preserve medieval or 17th century property boundaries. The large and massive Bloomberg building fills an entire block, or what in the medieval period comprised two blocks. The building is of a buff Derbyshire sandstone. The City of London is predominantly built of white Portland stone, with lesser buildings formed of red brick or yellow London stock brick. While the Bloomberg building is faced with the same stone as the finely detailed City of London Magistrates Court next door on Queen Street, it is used in large, smooth panels. The detailed facade of the Magistrates Court brings shadows and surfaces that face various directions, catching the light in different ways. While the stone may be from the same quarry, the effect is very different. The Bloomberg building is massive and relatively plain, while the adjacent buildings are human scale and finely detailed. Well, that's the Bloomberg building assessed. You can use Design Reviewer to assess any other development or to think about what matters in any other urban design project by structuring your thinking according to those eight questions. A much fuller version will appear in my new book, Essential Urban Design, out in 2021. Thanks for watching.